Paul Gonzalez, Harry Carney, Hilton Jefferson, Russell Procope, and Jimmy Hamilton, Wendell Marshall on the bass, Ellington and piano, and uh, Louis Belson on the drums. This is Skin Deep.
Yeah, that now, uh, you know, that that that's what Louie really could do. You know, I mean, he was he was uh he was wonderful to watch and wonderful to listen to. He was an inno innovator as far as uh that kind of soloing was concerned, you know, as opposed to Buddy where uh you know, you're talking about technique and all that. That that double bass drum thing really was uh, a very impressive thing. It used to knock people out. And uh you could really get some thing going. Of course, Buddy could do it with one foot, but because because uh, but Buddy wouldn't think of doing it with one foot unless he had to. Uh, and, and really, the only times he ever did it was when he and Louie did some battles of drums, and Louie would go into that thing, then Buddy would like, say, all right, I could do it better than you with one foot. You know? and, did, it, and did it. The same fashion? Well, the same idea, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, it was just sort of silly in a way, because why bother, you know, why, why bother? But if you, can, if you can control those two bass drums like that, and, you know, and it's a crowd pleaser. And, and, it, and it helped. It helped his career. You know, it made him a, a showcase, especially in Duke's band. You know, uh, I think it was a, it was a wonderful situation. And the guys in the band liked him. Well, he's uh, Louis. How can you not like Louis? Yeah, he's you know, a he's, lovely guy. He's a sweet person. You know, and uh, he plays from his heart. He really loves. He loves to do what he does. You know, uh, probably the most important thing he would like to do, which he doesn't, which he doesn't feel he does, uh, is swing. And. and uh, he, you know, does, he doesn't consider himself a real swinger, you know. I mean, he'd like to be, because he always says, like, uh, you know, one of the things he always talks about is that when the guys let him know, if guys let him know that, man, that thing was really, we really swinging, that's what makes him feel good. Well, I had a long talk with him uh, backstage. We did a concert together a couple of weeks ago, and the topic of these shows came up because he had heard about them. And uh, he mentioned, he told me, he said, well, he says, you know, when Buddy Rich and I would be together on the road or touring or doing drum battles or something like that, he said, you know, we'd always have a handful of recordings that we would listen to. And one of the ones that we were always listening to was Mel's records with either the, with Stan Kenton and mostly the ones with, uh, with Terry Gibbs's band. And Louis actually said to me, he said, you want to know something? He says, uh, he says, with all the soloing and I do and everything, he says, I traded if I could be the kind of drummer Mel is who just gets in and everybody in the band says, hey, it was really swinging. So that's quite a, uh, quite a compliment. Yeah, I know he feels that way. I mean, I didn't yeah. know he felt that way about that, but I mean... Uh, that's what he said. Uh, but... Uh, you know, I know, I know that Buddy used to go nuts. You know, Buddy felt the same way. And so I mean, it's nice to, it's nice to know that uh, people. You know, because I'm totally opposite of what they are. I could never do what they do. You know, yeah. but uh, and, and they could do what I did if they would, if they wanted to. I mean, or or or, or, or uh, didn't have to do what they do. I mean, they, they made their names as soloists. I made my name. I made my reputation. Not name because uh, I made my, rep my my reputation is mostly with music musicians. And I never became like a household name, you know. But uh, where which where they are, uh, but I made it swinging and with a good feeling. Yeah. And, and the things I can do in my my ears, you know. And uh, and I think that's important too, you know. I mean, that's why I've been able to make a good living all my life and uh, can do what I do. Uh, they have to sort of they had to lead. They, they ended up having having to be leaders. I'm a leader because uh, Thad and I had the band, you know, and when Thad left, I wasn't about to let what we built up to go down the drain. And Thad apparently didn't care as much as I did, you know, because if he, he should have. He should have stayed, but he didn't stay. And I wasn't about to let 13 years of great music, you know, just be lost while he goes and plays games with a, with a European band, which could never come up to this band, never. And... Uh, and uh, that's the way it had to be. So I found out I could lead. In fact, I found out that the drummer is the leader, and had been. Actually, I had been all along. The guys in the band told me they were following me. They weren't following. They didn't know what Thad meant with all his signals. I did, and I was guessing. Right. But that's how we did it, you know. And it was it was a great situation, which sorrow sorrowfully ended. But man, we're back in there today. You know, yeah. the band is the band is back up there on top again, and people starting to realize that. Uh, that uh, we got something. I mean, I'm really proud of it. And uh, Louis, like when Louis put, puts a band together. Now I've heard some of his his bands that he's coming to New York with, which are pickup bands. Right. And he, it's a tele. Now it's a telephone band, you know. And they're good. They're good bands. He always gets. He, he knows who can play in this town, and he gets them. And uh, thanks to his pleasant personality and all that, he gets the guys to work hard for him, you know. And he's had some darn nice sounding bands. And they weren't even organized, you know. They were just put together for yeah. engagement. You know. It's four minutes after the hour of 1 o'clock. You're listening to WKCR-FM in New York, 89.9 on your FM dial. And this is part eight of the history of jazz drums. Our special guest, 
is Mel Lewis. My name is Lauren Schoenberg, and uh, let's get back to Louis Bellson and listen to some tracks from the 1950s that show a different side of him. Uh, we'll begin one with him with some uh, real beboppers, Doug Metemy, the great Doug Metemy yeah. on trumpet, uh, Percy Heath on the bass, mm -hmm. uh, Bob DeRoe on piano, Irby Green on trombone, and Sam Most on clarinet and flute. And uh, from December 1953, we'll hear there, there Will Never Be Another You, which, according to some people, is Doug Metemy's second greatest solo after the famous solo on uh, Undercurrent Blues. Mm. And uh, Louis Belson on drums, a slightly different context. And then a record he's very proud of, which is interesting when I asked him about his favorite records. Uh, he didn't pick really the, the show-off pieces like Skin Deep. He yeah. said, play something with Art Tatum and Benny Carter trio. On which he, yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's he's just a totally supportive brush player on those That's records. Good, yeah. So let's listen to Louis Belson in 1953, 1954.
Yeah. Oh, that's that's nice. You know, and that's one of the toughest things for a drummer to do is uh, is play trio, you know, w without a bass, and uh, and uh, because uh, you have to play that four four on that bass drum, you know, and it's got to be even and it's got to sound good, you know. And then when you want to fool around a little bit with it, uh, you got to know when and where. Uh, or where or when. And here, I mean, no, to play with Art Tatum is uh, not only an honor, and I had that honor when I was like a teenager in Buffalo. I've got to play with him at, between sets and things at the, and, and that's what we did, you know, but, uh, but uh, unhappily never got to record with him, although we traveled together on a tour when I was with Kenton's band. He had his trio, and, and uh, Art, Art was just phenomenal. You know, I used to go onto the stage and listen and I'd hear his foot from the, you know, really? on, on, on one and three. You know, because that's where the swing comes from, right. one and three, not two and four. And uh, and uh, and he had uh, Slam Stewart and Everett Barksdale with him at the time. It was a, it was a wonderful trio. But um, here's a case where uh, Louis, you know, playing with Benny Carter. I mean, it's just it just worked out beautifully, you know. But on that solo he played, now and you could hear, see, also you got people got to realize that what you're listening to are calf skin heads. Big difference between them and plastic. These old, all these, uh, these, these pre, these early 50s or uh, recordings are. Uh, it's long before plastic came out, and and this is you're hearing real drums, being played by real people, getting a real sound. And uh, now that was a large bass drum too. That was not a small one. And uh, the only thing is, I I think Art came in too soon. Yeah. I'm, I, I I was pretty sure that the bridge. They just finished the bridge. Louis had just finished the bridge, or I don't know if he finished it yet. He was coming out of it, and uh, Art came in with the beginning of the tune. But I mean, of course, you can lose it. You know, it's not. There's, there's a. There's. E it's easy. I've. You know, <laughs> to throw throw people, and it doesn't matter anyway. Who no. cares? Yeah. yeah. But uh, an interesting side of Louis Belson's drumming. They're very far from the more technically stuff, technical stuff that he's known for. Yeah. But. Uh, and these are among his favorites. Oh, I can understand it. I can understand why, you know. He should be proud of these records, you know. He fit in perfectly, in other words. And before that, we heard the track with uh, Bob DeRoe and yeah. uh, Doug Metamy. Which was another nice thing, arrangement. Yeah. No, yeah. But, uh, no, no, you, 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 you always know what is your best stuff. I mean, you know. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned about that phone call about the two bass drums. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, a, fr uh, a friend of mine by the name of Chris called before and he reminded me of an article that was in uh in modern drummer magazine not too long ago a couple of years about a year ago two years i don't know and it was about ray mckinley where ray says that he uh his idea was to have two bass drums and that slingerland built him a kit you know uh but they were small bass drums and of course my answer was i had seen ray a lot during that time with with uh, will bradley and with his own band and uh i never ever saw him with two bass drums so uh, maybe if whether it was a, it might have just been an innovation, an idea, and the bass drums he had were small, they were like ten by twenty twos. Like, but if I have a ten by eighteen now that I use for gigs, uh, I don't think ten inch bass drums would have the carrying power that you would need in a big band. Mm -hmm. I, uh, Louis is still the man who got the credit for it, and I think he deserves it. You know, because I think if Ray really cared at that time, he would have really used them. He would have taken advantage of it because it's, it's, it's an innovation, and he obviously didn't, you know. So uh, it's sort of a, like a, a, an unseen situation that, yeah. or, or unheard of, and nobody realized that Ray had done it. But yeah. if he had used it, everybody would have known. But I never saw him ever do it, you know. We probably won't get around to playing Ray McKinley records until we complete the series, and and, and then we get done with, with, with your segments, which will take quite a while. So <laughs> in, in case we don't get around to uh, Ray McKinley and get to play some of his records, could you just, just tell us a little bit about him at, at this time? About Ray? Yeah. Well, because Ray, he's an unknown name these days. Well, uh, Ray McKinley was, uh, he comes out of Texas, you know, and uh, Ray McKinley, the first time I ever saw him was with Will Bradley's band. That's the first time I saw him. And he used to sing, you know, Beat me, uh, daddy ate at a bar. Beat me, daddy ate at a bar. Scrub me, mama. He'd sing, with a right from, yeah, he'd sing right from the drums. He had a microphone up there on, on a, like one of these things, you yeah. know, on, a, on one of those uh, stretch uh, stands or something that yeah. he'd pull it over in front of him and he'd be playing. And he'd be playing boogie woogie, you know. And he could swing his butt off, you know. Real swinger. And then when he, when he uh, later on formed his own band, I mean, he was also, an, uh, he knew about good music. He brought in people like Sauter, Eddie Sauter, and, uh, 
which was a great book he had. And uh, he still carried on with some of the boogie-woogie stuff because that's what he was famous for, you know. But uh, I had the honor of working for him on a... It was uh, one of those treasury shows or something like that, and they hired me to play drums. They had to put together a band. So they got as many of the old guys, Eddie Burt and Nick Travis and, and all those people that had been with the band in, the, in those days, Joe Ferranti. It was like, he, had a, he had good bands, you know. Mundell Lowe was here. Yeah, there. well, Mundell, yeah, Mundell was here there yeah. then, too, you know. And uh, they hired me to play drums on the things that he sang on, huh. you know. So he sang a few, few pieces, and I played drums, and then he came back. Then he sat down and played behind the drums, and I was knocked out. I mean, yeah. he's, oh, yeah, he swung from the word go. He knew how to play that uh, swing Dixie style, because that's what it was, you know. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, a lot of people don't really know about him as much as they he's should. He's still have. down in Texas. Yeah, 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 you know. Occasionally he pops up on a TV show or something. He was on a Glenn Miller thing. Yeah, but he was a, he was I think really he played drums with uh, Miller's band in, in Well, he was in, in the Europe. Army, yeah. No, he was in the service with the band. Right, right. And then when he came out, uh, of course, he... He formed his own band, you know. Mm -hmm. That's when he formed his own band, and uh, and then uh, I don't know if he did it right when he came out, but I think so. Yeah, he did. And uh, uh, later on, uh, the Miller Band, uh, after having uh, after Tex Beneke, when which I was with that Glenn Miller Band, then that band broke up. Uh, they broke it up, and there was no more Glenn Miller Band. And all of a sudden, they finally decided to reorganize it and put S. Ray McKinley to be the leader. Yeah. And he took it over and, uh, you know, then it became the St. Louis Blues March Band, you know. Right. <laughs> We're talking with Mel Lewis, and this is the History of Jazz Drums, Part 8 on WKCR-FM in New York, 89.9 on your FM dial. It's 1.21 in the afternoon, and we're going to plug right ahead with Louis Belson. Louis, after leaving Ellington and playing a lot, I think he still played with Harry James on and yeah, off. Yeah, he, he did off and on. A lot of different bands over the years. Uh, started leading his own groups and making his own recordings. A lot of great records that are unfortunately out of print and hard to get. And uh, had a very distinguished career throughout the 60s, 70s, right up till now in the 80s. We're going to sample a few items uh, of much more recent vintage of Louis Belson. One is one that... Uh, touches Mel because it uh, features uh, it's one of the first records by a guy who's been playing in Mel's band for seven or eight years now, the great Ted Nash. Mm -hmm. This is like a debut record for Ted when he was yeah. still out in California. Yeah. Rain Check, the Louis Belson Quintet featuring Ted Nash and Ted plays uh, let's see on this particular track we're going to hear much of whether it's alto or tenor, probably tenor. I think and he plays tenor in that group. Yeah, well, it yeah. says alto and tenor here. Yeah. yeah, but mostly I think he played tenor. Yeah. And uh, doesn't matter he plays Right, exactly. It's him anyway. Yeah. So. Uh, Ted Nash on tenor, Blue Mitchell on trumpet, Ross Tompkins piano, Joel DeBartolo on bass, yep. and Louis Belson on drums. Yeah, Joel's from my hometown, from Buffalo, and he's the bassist. He's that guy plugging away on an electric bass. He also, but he plays good upright. He's playing electric bass on the Tonight Show. Huh. You know, and Ross Tompkins, of course, is the piano player with that band too. Yeah. So we hear Ted Nash with Louis Belson. This is Sonny Rollins, Olio.
right. And we just heard Caravan by the Louis Belson Small Band with actually a couple of Mel Lewis Jazz Orchestra members sitting in yeah. with Louis for the recording. Glenn Drews on trumpet and Ted Nash on the tenor sax, Derek Smith, Remo Palmier, and Jay Lenhart. And before that, we heard Ted Nash on the alto on one of his very first records, Rain Check on the Concord label. We heard Olio uh, with, uh, with Louis Belson and friends. Any closing comments on, on Louis? No. Uh, actually, I mean, uh, it's funny. I could hear the difference between the, uh, the earlier records with the calf skins and now later on with the plastic. It's a different sound, you know. And it's not as heavy. I still prefer calf skin myself. You know, I, I like the sound that he got on the calf skin uh, because they're just so much richer, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, plastic is plastic, you know, and it sounds like plastic to me. But... Uh, but uh, it's still Louis all the way. His his basic thing, the thing that made him famous, uh, he's he's carried on throughout throughout, like Buddy did. You know, I think that's something uh, guys from that era felt they had to do. You know, if you make a name doing something, if you're famous for what you do, you should do it. You know, I mean, uh, I'm I, I have a freer situation you know I can I can go in any direction I want it still sound like me but I but they can't do that they're soloists they have a style and, a, and the people expect them to do certain things what uh, what makes Louis Belson a signature drummer the two bass drum technique the two the... bass drum technique is one thing and uh, and uh, and just the way he used them you know I mean uh, he try he's he doesn't play what buddy played he's got his own things going he's got this his routine was see Buddy's great thing was, uh, was that tore the crowds apart was his single stroke roll where he'd start fast yeah. as hell and slow it down to nothing, and then rebuild it and it's, and get it going lightning fast. You know, it was just ridiculous with with bass drum accents and all that. You know, and then finally cymbals and crashes. Louis's thing was would be to get the two bass drums going which would be electrifying, and then playing against it, playing, uh, and eventually start to get, he'd get this single stroke going on the snare drum going along with the two bass drums. And, of course, by that time, the place it was, then he'd also go eventually to cymbal crashes and things like that for excitement. And that's what people waited for, you know. That was his thing. His climaxes, in other words, you know. Louis Belson would as you said before, one of the loveliest men in the music business. Oh, yeah, you know. He's yeah. a sweet man. Yeah. You know, and you can hear the warmth in his playing. You know, he's, he's a very warm player. Yeah. It's 1.39, and you're listening to WKCR-FM in New York, 89.9 on your FM dial. The name of the show is Jazz Out to Lunch. It's heard Monday through Friday from noon to 3. This is Lauren Schoenberg, and I'm going to be uh, pretty much uh, gone from these airwaves until the end of September. I'll be back for one show in September 4th, and then that'll be it until October, and that's when we will pick up with part nine of the history of jazz drums, <laughs> which I, I'm very anxiously looking forward to, uh, with Mel Lewis. Uh, actually, you know what? Who knows? Maybe, maybe we can discuss it, and maybe in, in all those weeks that I won't be here, maybe you could come up with another host up here, and we could pick the records, and, and you could carry it on. Yeah, we could. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll toss that around. But, uh, in other words... That's what you're listening to. It's one. Th it's exactly 140. This is exactly WKCR FM in New York, 89.9 on your FM dial. Again, Mel Lewis is here, and it's a red letter day because it's another installment of the history of jazz drums. And who better to take us through the history of jazz drums than one of the greatest jazz drummers ever, Mr. Mel Lewis, who's right here. And uh, this is part eight, and it probably. Well, I can see at least.